before we kick on with the show today, a big announcement. Don't know if you saw, but we're going to be hosting our Wi-Fi day on September 19, 2024. It's going to be an amazing event. We've got so many great people lined up. There'll be a full agenda release very soon. So if you want to make sure that you're signed up and get it on your calendar so you can block out the day for the most fun day of the year, then get yourself signed up for Wi-Fi day early. But Mac, talking about today's webinar, what are we going to be doing? So today, guys, we are talking about something amazing. We actually experienced it firsthand in Las Vegas. We will be talking about how HP Aruba has handled this massive event with, I don't know how many people, like 1,500, 15,000, something crazy like that. Uh, so a lot of challenges, uh, how it was designed, how it was configured, uh, what was the design process. Then we, of course, surveyed the entire place. So we'll be talking about survey results as well. It's it's real. So I'm sure that tons of us are working in the massive event spaces and we are dying to learn the secrets from the superstar, Josh. So let's start with the real content, shall we? Yeah, and a quick round of introductions before we jump into it. You've got Mac and myself both looking after product marketing and ECC over here at Eggerhow. And we've got our amazing sales engineers, Dale and Justin, both based in Americas. They'll be helping out with all of the questions in the Q&A. So feel free to fire stuff in today. We'll be answering things as we go in the chat. And then also we'll be pinging some questions over to Josh. And we've got Stu who heads up our community engagement as well. So he'll be also helping out in there too. But like Mac said, the star of the show today is Josh. So Josh... Welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Maybe you just want to do a quick introduction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Mac. Uh, so uh, I'm Josh, uh, Josh Schmelzel. Um, I am a uh, technical marketing engineer at HPE Aruba. Um, I've been here for a couple of years now. I joined in 21 um, and I'm focused on Wi-Fi stuff. Uh, I'm I've been a proud member of the event network team for the last three years as well. Um, and I've been doing Wi-Fi things for about the last last 10 years. Um, so, so that's about me. All right. Well, in that case, Josh, I'm going to stop the share and hand over to you because I know you've got some amazing, amazing things to talk to us about Wi-Fi 7. I've been so excited to, to see what you've got for this webinar first kind of real like big Wi-Fi 7 deployment. I know there's going to be so many great tips and tricks in this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to come on uh, this webinar and talk about what we did uh, for HPE Discover in Aruba Atmosphere uh, here in uh, Las Vegas this last month in June. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of different things. I, first, I want to talk about Wi-Fi 7, kind of just what it is for people who may be hearing about it for the first time. Um, and then we'll talk about the design, uh, some of the input that we used in, uh, for the planning phase. Uh, I'll show you some pictures. We'll go over some stats. Uh, and then after that, uh, I'll hand it back to you to uh, Ekahal to cover some of the survey stuff. Um, so first and foremost, let's talk about Wi-Fi 7. Um, and so there's, there's some features and benefits uh, to Wi-Fi 7. And uh, Wi-Fi 7 you know, brings uh, higher throughput, transmission rates, uh, it aims to provide better latency and re reliability, and also improve the, the spectral efficiency. Um, so from a features perspective, it does, does uh, it, it provides these benefits through things like tri-band operation. So Wi-Fi 7 uh, can operate 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz. Um, most uh, devices will support 6 gigahertz, uh, but um, it's not technically required. Um, so there's that. There's 320 megahertz channels, uh, and these are applicable in 6 gigahertz only. Um, then there's multi-link operation. This is one of the features that will bring better latency and reliability, hopefully, um, as well as the, the better throughput transmission also uh, indirectly benefits uh, reliability and, and latency as well. Uh, so 4K QAM, that's one of the ways we get faster transmission rates. Uh, then we have this flexible channel utilization concept, which is actually two features. It's spectrum puncturing and multiple resource units. Then we have uh, some QoS features uh, where we can do uh, 
triggered triggered based uplink for OFDMA. So triggered uplink access. And then there's some uh, enhancements in the block act side of things, as well as improvements to target wake time, uh, restricted target wake time. So uh, from a use case perspective, things that are being marketed at for Wi-Fi 7 include things like high definition streaming, extended reality, which is just a term that encompasses things like mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality. Those things all kind of bucket into this extended reality concept. Uh, things like remote office, cloud computing, and gaming um, are some of the things that the, the project itself is, is marketed towards. But Wi-Fi 7 is something that can help with uh, reliability and performance uh, on, your, on your network. So it's something to consider um, for your next deployment um, in terms of what hardware you're, you're looking at. So let's talk about uh, some of the, the things that I just mentioned. So for six gigahertz, um, for those that you are that might not be aware, um, it introduces uh, about 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum or 1200 megahertz of spectrum. And how much of that spectrum is available for use depends on where you are uh, in the world. Um, in North America, uh, in the United States, you know, there's the 1200 megahertz uh, split into different bands uh, called Uni 5 through Uni 8. Uh, in places like Europe, um, in, in other countries, only the bottom 500 megahertz of the spectrum is open. And because there's a 20 megahertz guard band, um, you only get 480 megahertz of spectrum in those countries. Uh, but in terms of Wi-Fi 7, Wi-Fi 7 adds this 320 megahertz uh, channel width. Uh, and what that essentially does is doubles the transfer rates. Uh, and there's actually two sets of them. Um, and the reason for this is to make the best fit across different regulatory domains around, around the globe. Um, you would only use one or two. You want to use both at the same time. Um, something to think about with 320 megahertz is the, the noise floor for 320 megahertz is quite high. It starts at neg 89. There's only three channels to use. And um, for standard power operations, which is kind of out of scope for this webinar, um, there's only one 320 megahertz channel available um, for standard power or also in a country where you only have the bottom portion of the six gigahertz band open to you. So what that looks like though on a spec and um, this is what 320 megahertz looks like. Um, it takes up quite a bit of the band. Um, and from a packet capture perspective, you can look in the the uh, EHT operation uh, uh, information element in the control field. Uh, and that's how it's indicated um, to different clients. Uh, if you were to connect a two spatial stream device to a 320 megahertz channel, uh, the, the, the max phi rates that uh, would be indicated would be 5.7 uh, gigabits. So that's 320 megahertz channels and six gigahertz. 4K QAM, so in, in Wi-Fi, we have this, this concept of modulation. Um, up until Wi-Fi 6, we had uh, modulations that went up to 1024 QAM or 1K QAM, which is a 10-bit symbol. Um, uh, then we have MCS 10 and MCS 11 associated with 1K QAM. Wi-Fi 7 introduces 4K QAM, uh, and we get two new MCS rates that offer uh, 8% or 20% more um, uh, th data throughput um, from a, a rate perspective. Uh, the thing to note here is that these new MCS rates do come out with a little bit of cost of reduced range because of the complexity of the, um, the symbol uh, in order to demodulate uh, a 12-bit symbol. So, um, We'll talk about those challenges a little bit later in terms of how that impacts your planning for, for Wi-Fi 7. Uh, so then there's also multi-link operation. Um, so multi-link operation is a, a very um, a high marketed feature for Wi-Fi 7. It helps with, uh, with latency, throughput and reliability. Uh, and this is a feature that gives the client the ability to connect on multiple links uh, 
at the same time. Uh, and there's two primarily types. Uh, Wi-Fi 7 clients can um, operate in this uh, switching mode where it can switch between links. Uh, and so the, the client can alternate between links uh, in order to avoid interference. Uh, and what this allows the client to do is to have better control over latency when there's congestion in the air. Uh, then the second type is a concurrent or a aggregation sort of feature with, with the client being able to simultaneously transmit and receive at the same time on multiple links. Um, so clients will have different uh, levels of capabilities of being able to switch between links and also combine links depending on some of the capabilities of the client. Um, we're not going to focus too much on that during this, this webinar. Uh, the other thing that Wi-Fi 7 provides is the ability to um, flex channel utilization around interference. And um, what this allows clients to do is to use a combination of spectrum puncturing or preamble puncturing to isolate uh, uh, interference um, say to the left of channel 53 here in six gigahertz, and then use this thing called multiple resource units in order to transmit um, and receive around the interference. Um, so that's a feature that comes with, with Wi-Fi 7. And that, that's why we say that Wi-Fi 7 can have some spectral efficiency gains uh, when we can combine things like preamble puncturing and multiple resource units at the same time. Okay, cool. So let's talk about um, our Wi-Fi 7 access points uh, before we get into the event stuff. So uh, uh, back in late April, we announced the uh, 730 series of our campus access points. Uh, and these are targeted as a mid-range uh, platform um, for Wi-Fi 7. And these are two by two tri-radio access points. Uh, we'll be flushing out our portfolio um, following this as well. So this is just the first uh, release of the Wi-Fi 7 capability uh, with our portfolio. Um, we're going to start shipping these hopefully uh, mid to late next month in August. Um, and we have two models. There's the 735, which has the integrated antennas. These are omnidirectional down tilt. And then we have the 734. Uh, the 734 is connectorized, uh, so it allows us to connect some external antennas. Uh, we have ultra tri-band filtering, and we have some flex radio options with these uh, platforms, at least for the 735, uh, where we can run in dual five or dual six. Um, we have multi-user MIMO. Um, we have MaxSec uh, that we'll be releasing in AOS 10.7.1. Um, these have uh, uh, Bluetooth 5.4 uh, integrated, um, so that it comes with the high accuracy distance measurement. Uh, then we've improved a bunch of the sensors inside the platform as well, from GPS or GNSS to the barometer to also supporting the latest fine time measurement standard uh, with .11AZ. Our previous platforms had .11MZ or MC, I should say. Um, this platform also has two USB ports. Uh, and then we also have a wake on LAN feature uh, that is called Deep Sleep um, in order to put APs into uh, PowerSafe. Um, and these APs will operate on class four power um, with some limited restrictions, uh, mostly around the USB ports. So if you want to use both USB ports, uh, you're going to want class six power. Um, and all the other normal things with uh, environmentals and physicals with this platform. Now, from a size perspective, these are very similar in size to our previous like AP635. Um, and from a software perspective, these require um, 10.7. And I noticed a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, so like, does Wi-Fi 7 require two 10 gig uplinks? No, no, it does not. Um, but we do recommend considering smart rate. So at least two and a half or five gigs. 
Uh, will the 700 series only support AOS 10 via, via central? Yes, uh, these require AOS 10. There is no AOS 8 support. Um, and for some of these other things like USB ports, mainly like IoT related uh, and whatnot. Okay, so let's move on from the, the hardware because we want to talk about the event network even though that, that's the hardware we used at the event network. So uh, HPE Discover, Aruba Atmosphere, uh, was a joint conference this year. So historically, Aruba Atmosphere was a separate conference from HPE Discover. Uh, and in 2000, uh, this year, 2024, we've combined the conference into one. So, so we've joined Discover and Aruba Atmosphere into the same conference. And this was held at the Venetian Expo uh, in Las Vegas. So this is kind of where that looked, that where that actually uh, happened at. And from a, a design perspective, I'm I'm on part of the I'm part of the event network team that that did the the planning for for all of this. So there was a team of us involved, and most of us are based out of the the business unit under under the the product that produces the product teams that produce our Wi-Fi product. And the reason why we do that is so that uh, the the technical marketing engineers that work closely with the product get a chance to have hands-on experience in this sort of event setup to to showcase the technology so that we can better talk to it internally and we can provide feedback to our different, um, different business units internally, whether um, it's PLM or we're talking to engineering and whatnot. And it gives us opportunity to, to test things before the product gets into your hands. Um, so uh, we get to validate things like best practices and, and um, really put our, our um, really put uh, our, our skill set um, to, to test and, and whatnot. So from a from an event specific perspective, one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that we could securely connect over 10,000 clients. Um, and we did a few different things in terms of, of planning for which Wi-Fi technologies were offered. So we, we had a very large event network um, and a portion of it was Wi-Fi 7 and a portion of it was Wi-Fi 6, which we'll explain in a little bit. Uh, and we wanted to provide a seamless experience for attendees uh, from the hotel rooms in the Venetian um, to discover. So for those of you that are not familiar, the Venetian has the, the Palazzo, it has the Venetian Hotel, and it also has the, the Venzia as well. So one of the things we wanted to do is provide the event network uh, in those rooms so that attendees could seamlessly um, be connected in the rooms. And then as they walk to the, to the expo center, also have uh, a seamless experience as they transition in between spaces. From a expo uh, hall perspective, um, we we were tasked with about covering 300,000 square feet. Um, so that's split between the showcase network, which is the expo hall, and the general session. And I have some pictures we'll, we'll, we'll look at real quick, uh, very shortly. From a, a client's perspective, you know, we from previous years, we 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 kind of had this uh, one for one adoption rate at atmosphere conferences. So typically, the the attendees, the the customers, the partners um, that came to atmosphere would connect to the network. From a Discover perspective, uh, at that conference, the adoption rate uh, historically wasn't as high. So we predicted that we would need to connect at least 10,000 devices at the same time. So from a scaling perspective, our, our number was around 16,000. So when we're doing things like setting up DHCP scopes, whatnot, and subnets, you know, those are sorts of the, uh, the numbers we were thinking about catering for. And then we also wanted to leverage the existing APs that the venue has. So the venue has close to 10,000 access points um, running AOS 8. Uh, and Aruba, HPE Aruba networking access points. And we wanted to leverage those. So from a conference perspective, we had uh, quite a few different areas we wanted to cover. Um, so we put Wi-Fi 7 in private 5G in the expo hall. So the expo hall here is on, on level two. 
Uh, and this is this room is is larger than three hundred thousand square feet, um, but the area that we covered was about 300,000 300, square feet. So um, the miniature version of the floor plan is here. The showcase is 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 in the middle here, and then the general session, uh, which historically for Aruba Atmosphere events we used to call these the keynote. But the keynote this year was at the Sphere. Um, from a from an event network perspective, we did not uh, provide uh, any sort of services uh, to the, the sphere for the event network. Um, so the general session, uh, so where we had the, the business session and the technical sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday uh, were held in the back of the, the expo or the showcase. Um, and in these other areas, we also needed to provide coverage. Uh, and that's where we used uh, what we call multi-zone. Uh, and multi-zone basically allows an access point to create tunnels to different uh, gateways or controllers, if you will. Um, and that allows the access point to provide uh, WLANs from, from different, um, different areas of control. So we had control over a few uh, WLANs, and then uh, for the for the uh, networks that were on the the access points from the venue. Um, so that aside, so Wi-Fi seven, right? Wi-Fi seven was in the expo hall, and that's the focus of what we're going to talk about for this uh, conference or for this webinar. So, uh, how many access points did we actually deploy for Wi-Fi seven? We we put an overlay of one hundred and seventy six. Uh, AP 735s to run this network. Uh, these are pre-production units. Uh, we ran pre-beta code. We just started uh, with, we're in a beta two right now from a testing perspective. Um, and we managed these uh, from uh, Ruba Central on a, on a development cluster. So we were running um, code uh, from a firmware perspective that, that was pretty fresh. Um, we went through a couple iterations of code uh, just days before we, we lit up the event. So because we were running um, uh, very new hardware, uh, we did plan for some backups. Um, so we, we did bring some AP 600 series. Uh, and then um, we also had a bunch of demo APs as well. So how do we plan for uh, an event like this? So for those of you that did not attend the event, this is what the general session looked like. So that's the stage and we have a bunch of chairs and whatnot. And from a, a planning perspective, the approach we took was to put our overlay network under seat. So we plan for about 66 access points. So around 80 seats per access point. Um, in the general session area. Uh, and we also had some others sprinkled in there for some demos as well, uh, and also to support the, the stage as well. So this is, again, this is another picture from the general session. So the access points were, were under seat, uh, under, under these seats. Uh, so for the showcase, this is kind of what the showcase looks like before it was built out. Uh, this is a picture from the, the catwalk. Uh, and this is the floor plan for what that looks like. So what I want to do is switch over to Ekahau for a little bit, uh, Ekahau AI Pro to show you kind of some of the things that we did from a planning perspective. So one of the big challenges with a, an event like this is all the changes in the floor plans. Um, so uh, like the showcase floor plan, for example, um, we went through 12 different versions of the floor plan. Uh, so there's a lot of um, planning and then replanning and, and moving things around and a lot of different, uh, uh, so, so you'll see some different colors here. Um, and that represents some of the ways that we decided to mount access points. Um, and I have some pictures we'll, we'll show you, I'll show you a little bit later, but we, we hit a lot of access points um, in booths we, we put like these APs in the cafeteria where we're under the table, uh, whatnot. So uh, we try to put access points as close to the users as possible. Um, 
and uh, in the the atmosphere zone. So this floor plan was split into a couple of different zones that were focused on either the compute segment of disc of uh, HPE or say Aruba, for example, or um, uh, some of the the AI sort of uh, HPE Green Lake sort of uh, focused areas. So what we what we did uh, in a lot of cases we we put APs inside of of demo booths um, and structures, um, and then in the atmosphere zone we tried to show off as many of them as we could. Um, from a, <laughs> a planning perspective, with the under undersea deployment, we needed to figure out how to um how long our cable lengths needed to to be so i used we heavily used the the cabling tool to plan out um numbers of copper cables that we needed to order and what lengths and whatnot and we also ended up doing that for uh the fiber as well so we put in a entire switch switching infrastructure uh, as well we deployed over 100 switches um throughout the, the event network, whether it was in the core, the aggregation layer up in the catwalks uh, or edge switches uh, down below as well. So we use this cabling tool uh, quite a bit as well to plan out what we needed from a fiber perspective too. And then here's some of the pictures of how we mounted the, the 735s throughout the uh, throughout the, the showcase. And then under, under seat, this is how we mounted the, the APs uh, or placed the APs under seat as well. So we put them on the, the flat E brackets and then we, uh, we taped the, the cables down. So from challenging, what are some of the challenges that we faced? Um, so when you put a lot of access points in, in a place like this, you have uh, you're going to have some co-channel interference because you're going to have APs on the same channels because you don't have enough spectrum, um, to not have any overlap. So this is a, this is a path loss visualization from the center AP in the general session, uh, and just showing that, Hey, it can, it has, a, a, a computed a path loss value between all the APs that it can hear and it can hear all the access points in this room. Here's another perspective when we look at that same concept from the AP on the left side to all these other APs. Uh, it doesn't have path loss to some of the APs on the very right side of the, the four plan here, um, but it does to a lot of APs. So and we'll look so at Josh, an AP in the center. Go ahead. Um, how many APs did you say you had in this, in this section here? So in this section here, we had about 100 APs. Um, uh, and so... You know, you, you can guarantee that you're going to have, you know, five or six APs on the same channel um, uh, with the, the density that we went with. Definitely on five gigahertz. That's like a best case scenario, right? If you're able to use all of the five gigahertz channels, you're looking at three, four, five CCI at best. So this really screams to me the importance and need for six gigahertz and ultimately Wi-Fi 7 as well for these kinds of deployments. Right. So uh, here's just a snapshot. This was the snapshot from before. Uh, I think anybody was actually in the showcase um, because Mac uh, will show what he saw um, in a little bit, and it was much more heavily used. But you can see that there's there's competing um, infrastructures or competing overlays in the same space using the same spectrum. We have some APs using 20 megahertz, which is what we set the channel with for us. And then we have APs using uh, 40s and, and 80s uh, that, that we had no control over. Um, so there's definitely a lot of RF challenges when you, when you think about planning and deploying a temporary event network. Um, from a six gigahertz perspective, it's pretty clean at the moment I took this snapshot um, and we were using uh, 80 megahertz channels uh, in in six gigahertz. So from a event network setup perspective, like what WLANs did we just deploy and how did we deploy them? 
So our main SSID here was HPE Discover, uh, and we used Enhanced Open. Um, and one of the reasons we did that was is so that we could use six gigahertz um, because we need to use Enhanced Open from a security mode perspective for unauthenticated networks in six gigahertz. We can't use straight straight open in six gigahertz. So um, that's one of the challenges of adopting technologies like six gigahertz is we have to think about what security modes we, we're gonna use. Um, so for HPE Discover, we had the SSID on five and six gigahertz. And we did that for all of our SSIDs. They were on both five gigahertz and six. So they were dual band uh, five plus six SSIDs. We had our Passpoint SSID, uh, and we'll share some stats in a little bit about how many were on these different SSIDs. But Passpoint is a technology that allows cellular handover to Wi-Fi. So our SSID name there was Aruba AirPass. Uh, and for Passpoint and also our corporate SSID, these are .1x networks. Um, and so we needed to use WPA3 in order to to turn up the SSID on six gigahertz. So if you're thinking about six gigahertz for your uh, for either your networks or your your customer's network, um, WPA3 is something that you have to to adopt in order to use six gigahertz if you're not going to use enhanced open. Um, and so in this case, uh, we used uh, just the WPA3 enterprise uh, security mode uh, for both Passpoint and HPE. Um, and this is what it looks like if you were to uh, run show network on a AOS 10 AP. Um, so numbers wise, again, we had 176 AP 735s. We used a three node gateway cluster. Uh, so we tunneled everything to a gateway cluster. This was our 9114 series. Uh, for routing, we used Edge Connect uh, switching. We had 138. Uh, CX switches, uh, various models, uh, all managed by Central. Uh, from a cabling perspective, there's a lot of planning for, for cabling that didn't necessarily get into uh, or have time to get into, but we had over 30 miles of cable planned for, for uh, copper ethernet. And then we had over three miles of fiber optic cable to interconnect all of the different uh, core and aggregation stuff. So let's talk about event stats. Um, on the Wi-Fi 7 overlay, so inside that showcase area, uh, we we saw almost uh, 12,000 on June 17th. So that was the first general session. And then about 12.5 on, on June 18th. Um, and so when, that was, and that's total unique clients. Concurrently, during the, the, the general sessions, we saw about uh, four and a half and, and five and a half on each day, respectively. So, and during that, those snapshots and both days looked pretty similar. About 25% of those clients use six gigahertz. So about a thousand clients during the general session. And that, that room, that general session room has about 5,000 seats. So for the people who connected, about 25% of them used six gigahertz, 22% of them used Passpoint, uh, and we had uh, AT&T and T-Mobile enabled for Passpoint. So again, people using AT&T and T-Mobile, uh, they could um, hand off to, to Wi-Fi automatically using Passpoint. Um, and then 5% of those during the general session were Wi-Fi 7. Um, and if we go look at the total for the week, um, you know, about 69% of people used our Discover network, 28% used Passpoint, and 3% used uh, were, were corporate employees. And so during that general session, we had about 3% or we had 5% of Wi-Fi 7 clients. But if we look at the total unique clients for the week, we had about 3% of them were Wi-Fi 7 that that number ended up being about 572 clients. And I have a breakdown on the next slide we'll talk about. Almost 80% were Wi-Fi 6. Uh, and this grew about 3% from the previous year. 10% uh, were Wi-Fi 5. And that was down 11% from last year. And then uh, about 8% were Wi-Fi 4 clients. Uh, and this is actually more Wi-Fi 4 clients than we saw last year. But we think that's because of the combination of the Discover 
uh, the people who would typically attend Discover and the people who attend Aruba Atmosphere. Um, so you have to remember that when we join the conference, we have different uh, different sorts of people that attend depending on what they're focused on. So uh, people who attend Discover were less Wi-Fi focused than the people who attend uh, Atmosphere. And when we join everything, uh, the conferences together, we get a mix of people who care about different things. Uh, the people who, who join and attend uh, Atmosphere tend to bring the, the latest and greatest devices. So that's kind of why we think that the Wi-Fi 4 number grew a little bit, because it, it was an odd one to see. Uh, but in terms of what clients, so where are the Wi-Fi 7 clients? What are they? Uh, for people who attended, um, most the majority of them that we could identify, and we identified these through the host name, um, about 36% were either a Pixel 8, a Google Pixel 8, or an 8 Pro. 18% uh, of them were Samsung, so either S24 or S24 Ultra. And then there were some uh, different ones, like from a OnePlus 11 or 12, there's some Xiaomi's, uh, Asus Zenfone, and then there was one HP Omen 14. Um, there was 44% that did not identify themselves through the, the host name. Uh, so it's kind of a breakdown of what actual Wi-Fi 7 clients showed up at this event. Cool. So I'm going to stop sharing and start helping out answer questions. Mm -hmm. So if you have more questions, just uh, pop them in the chat. Yeah, uh, let's, I'll, let's I'll... track a few questions. Matthew, yes, start. You start. No, well, I just I just really wanted to say that a few things that uh, Josh, you highlighted that it's not really Wi-Fi kind of related, but so key to factor in for when you're doing such large conference Wi-Fi. A couple of things, obviously, when you talk about the DHCP scoping, all of the rest of the network, the amount of cable you had to run. I saw someone asking, you know, more importantly, how much gaffer tape had to be used to, you know, connect some of these things together and hold them in place. But another thing is just like the the logistics. Obviously, you're only there for temporarily um, for, for that week. And you're going to put, you showed the picture of some of the access points under seat. And then someone replied to someone asking about that type of deployment. But the logistics of having to go into an event and then install things overhead is that's what you would have ideally liked to have done, I would have assumed. But then logistically trying to hire something like a, a scissor lift or a lifter and getting people in to do that just for a temporary event must be really hard. So you have to factor that in sometimes for, for the wider uh, good of the um, the network. So I found that really interesting to, to, to see. So thank you so much for that, Josh. And OK, cool. Well, why don't we take a look at some of the uh, survey data? from the event so there was lots of people there from the echo team so mac you was there justin Stu, and we also had uh, ari and dan and this is the section that was surveyed and you can tell that there was multiple users dividing and conquering at the same time because you can tell by the different colors of the survey paths look, look, look who got on top when it comes to the distance Walked. I I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm just as shocked as everyone else on the webinar that Mac actually did some work for once, right? I mean, uh, I was expecting this to be at, at, at the bottom. But yes, like the the this is a and an, maybe it maybe doesn't quite do it justice from this screenshot, but obviously this is a huge event. And to have one person trying to catch all of this data whilst being on the booth and attending events, it would be really uh, quite daunting. So the fact that you can just share a project file and have three, four, five of you all serving at the same time to divide and conquer makes it so much more manageable. And mm -hmm. I can see that there's different types of surveys that were done, but ultimately a lot of it was autopilot. But Mac, did you use the Just Go survey mode by any chance whilst you were there? Well, we were testing the Just Go and it worked perfectly. So guys, like for those of you that don't know Just Go, Just Go is a survey type that you can do with like a house Sidekick, Sidekick 2 and the iOS device leveraging the Apple AR kit, which is a compass, gyroscope, accelerometer, LiDAR, camera, did I say GPS? It's like all the sensors that you have there to position yourself. And also when you walk around, it scans the environment for you and creates the floor plan. And yes, it also works at the conference. But all the service that we have done as a team, uh, we've done using the autopilot. So autopilot still uses the floor plan. So we use the real floor plan, scaled it, uh, calibrated it, and then walked around. Now, the fun fact is I've done like this two kilometers walk and I had to adjust my position only once. 
And that was when we were in the middle of the of the sphere, like in the middle of the convention hall, where we had this massive sphere and it was tons of lights, tons of reflections. So that confused the camera, but it was spot on, spot on. Such an inappropriate choice of description there, because the keynote was done at the sphere, and this isn't the sphere that we're talking about. This is the actual part of the the conference, right? So just not to confuse people, we didn't. I don't think you guys went and surveyed the actual, you know, the sphere where they had the keynote. But this was in the main like conference hall where the uh, or the breakout space where the uh, the booths were and stuff. So. Um, one of the things I like to I I found really interesting to see here is that just seeing the density of the five gigahertz access points, we're kind of just like scrolling through the survey path in the survey application right now, and then when it flicks to the six gigahertz, you can see that there's so much more capacity available to use in six gigahertz on the amount of channels. And the um, Yekahel booth, as always at these kind of events, was was pretty jam packed, and there was uh, there was kind enough to have a nice. Uh, access point pretty close by for us to ensure we had great connectivity at, at the booth. So, um, hey, Mac, I think you had some demos you wanted to show in Echo AI Pro of the data. So let me stop the share and pass it over to you, my friend. Absolutely. And I'm thrilled for you to call me friend again. Typically, I'm a colleague <laughs> on webinars now. Okay, guys. So what we are looking at here is the survey results. So we, we've done the survey, we've done our autopilots, and we are now looking at uh, Echo AI Pro. And this is the signal strength. So signal strength was, of course, spot on everywhere. Uh, let's take a look at the secondary signal strength. So guys, secondary signal strength is extremely important for the roaming, for capacity, for AP redundancy, and it's also spot on mm. everywhere. Uh, so we know that the design was great because it was done by great people, right, Josh? And the, the, the kit was spot on as well. The mounting was great. We were using the attenuation of the booths. It wasn't too too dense, uh, the placement of the APs. It was just right. Uh, it was enough APs to cater for capacity. So let's take a look at that capacity. So that's where we were. That's where the wireless nerds were hanging out. So let me zoom in a little bit. I will go to inspect so we have a little bit more information. So we can see all these data points. These are the data points collected by the sidekick when you were walking, ar walking around. I want to dive into like, what is this 2.4 time division duplex? doing so i can click on any of these data points and when i switch to 2.4 gigahertz i can see here that i have time division duplex uh, found so basically what we're looking at here is like a very 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 heavily utilized spectrum uh, from the iot well we have like ofdm 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 on channels 1 6 and 11 of course but also we have discovery well we have the advertisement channels from the ble before channel one then here then here and we have identified that like after channel 13 that it is a an interferer, and you can see like all the uh, all the stuff in the back, like the yellow spectrum utilization. This will be caused by by the I O I O T. So let's check like a few more uh, different spots. So I will go to the other side. There is like some continuous transmitter. So let's like I don't know, click somewhere there and see what happens. Uh, so here, like look at that, guys. At this point, at this point, the spectrum was so massively overutilized. We can still see some trace of O F D M transmissions. But this was just killed by non-Wi-Fi interference. Non-Wi-Fi interference. So when you try to use uh, to use troubleshooting tools without Spectrum Analyzer, you will not be able to see that stuff. So you will see that Wi-Fi doesn't work, but you will not know why Wi-Fi doesn't work. So it's very important to be able to see that granularity. Okay, so that was uh, 2.4 and 5, primary and secondary signal strength. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the configuration. So I will come back to, to where we were. We were like somewhere, somewhere around here. Uh, so I will highlight like one of the uh, access points. So let me like click somewhere closer to the APs and go to five gigs. You did see that we had no access points on 2.4 gigahertz because we didn't have 2.4 there. I will highlight like one of the first APs and I want to check what was the configuration of these access points. So I can click on the eye and we can see the list of the SSIDs being broadcasted by this access point. But most importantly, look at that, MBR 24 megabits per second. This is perfect. You can't do it any better. Uh, 24 megabits per second set as minimum basic data rate is spot on for conferences like this. That means that we will not be using tons of airtime for non-data frames transmissions. So all the control and management traffic will be sent at 24 megabits per second, which is spot on, okay? You don't want to leave it on default. You don't want to use one or two or six megs per second. You want to set it to at least 12, preferably 24. So yeah, well done. Additionally, we have 
15 dBm uh, transmitting power levels set on the radio level. That combined with like five or six, let's say five dBi passive gain of the antennas in brand new Aruba 735 APs, uh, this will be an equivalent to like 20 dBm radiated power, EIRP. Now, when you compare that to like a typical iPhone, iPad, whatever, it's like 20, 21 uh, dBm transmitting power level minus passive loss of the printed very thin antenna, like one or two dBs, we have a match between transmitting power levels of the APs, transmitting power levels of uh, the mobile devices. We don't have asymmetric transmissions. We are matching uh, the clients. Why is it important? Because like you might think that at a conference like this, it would make sense to drop the transmitting power levels to something lower to contain, uh, to contain the CCI, same channel interference. But would you really do that by by using low transmitting power levels. Why am I mentioning it? Every second conference we attend, they have access points with very low transmitting power levels. And what it does, it will slightly reduce the CCI from the access points perspective. But how about our clients? Will they, will they reduce their transmitting power levels? No. So we have 100 access points, but we have 10,000 clients. And clients will still be contributing to client-induced CCI. So it's best to match the transmitting power levels. And that is everything I had for you yesterday. Uh, yesterday <laughs> today. Uh, Mac, uh, before you uh, leave AR Pro, there's a few people in uh, the chat and stuff. Um, yep. One particularly, they're interested in looking at the continuous transmitter that we've uh, detected there in uh, five gigahertz as well, right? So you can, you should be able to okay. see the mirror. Continuous transmitter on five gigahertz. So some are here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me check. I haven't checked this. So let's let's see what it is. So I will like click somewhere on the survey path and now we're on five gigs. And oh my god, this is like so much stuff going on in here. Let's zoom it in a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. Maybe we'll see a little bit better. Uh, I would probably need to spend a little bit more time like zooming in and checking what was really happening there, like section by section. But so far here, I don't see any dodgy transmitters. Uh, stop me if you see something. Nothing here, so let me zoom out. Then another segment. I'm winging it, guys. So I haven't, I haven't really looked at it. I can't see anything. Another segment. Can you see it, darling, or anyone? It was a bit of a blip on that one from the five gigahertz uh, at that event. It was, um, it was random. It will pop in and out. You, you will see it. I think it's just you probably gone um, ahead in the survey a little bit, uh, Mac. Okay, let's yeah, try to go go back, and let's put that back in. And well, should I try somewhere else? It's probably too much stuff happening to like see it clearly at this point. Yeah, it's 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 hiding there. There's yeah. a way to uh, splice it out. Yeah, I think it's just a little not. Uh... Oh, there we go. Look yeah. at that. Was it here? Uh, let's go back. Yeah. No, it's just this like black outline. Okay, so I can't I can't really find it. But um, there was actually from an interference perspective, folks, and and just started to, to chime in here quickly. But um, there was one thing that um, that Josh and I kind of we saw where we had a uh, particular. I guess you could say vendor, right? Actually, where you're clicking right there. Um, in that area, they had a 2.4 gigahertz transmitter of some sort. And almost what it was doing was almost like it was slicing, like what Josh was talking about earlier. It was poking in through the actual um, the RF. I do have a recording of it. It's actually really cool. It almost looks like kind of like scratch marks on the on a chalkboard. I've never, I've first time I've actually seen it like that. Uh, in a while but um it was an interesting thing where the sidekick actually picked that up um it was turned off during this part of the survey but we did see it earlier and so when you talk about um tracking down pre-event uh, and using a spectrum analysis tool to kind of get a lay of the land um that's something that's going to be really important and i think that's what uh, uh helped out uh, josh's team kind of figure out you know those uh, being kind of the rf police uh, so to speak right josh yeah we were trying to figure out some uh channel utilization things uh, and using the spectrum analyzer walking around uh, was pretty useful. Uh, and in order just to do some comparisons from the AP's perspective versus what the sidekick thought.
Good stuff, man. Guys, look look at the 6 gigahertz utilization just as a comparison. I had it set to the EU uh, regulatory domain, so I don't see all the channels. Uh, Josh did show us all the channels, but like it wasn't like what Josh has uh, caught in just one single place where it wasn't like super heavily utilized. As I'm moving the slider, I am really moving around uh, the entire convention center. Uh, this has been captured when people started rolling in. So this was at the beginning of the conference. Uh, it was getting full, but not everyone was onboarded on Wi-Fi yet. Uh, so towards the end of the conference, it was the utilization was higher, but you can see the trend that the util utilization is there, but it's not as overwhelming as the utilization anywhere on five gigs, where it will be like spread across the spectrum quite, quite nicely and equally. So well done, well done there. Okay, so I think that's it when it comes to the AI Pro. Uh, let's get some more questions. What do we have? Whilst we are going through the questions, I think you wanted to talk about... <laughs> yeah, so of course, there is a love relationship going between uh, HP, Aruba, and Eka. How That's how we've conducted all the surveys and captured the information. So it's a lot of love. And if you don't believe me that I love this product, that I love my Aruba 735, one of the best access points in the market now, this is my unbiased opinion. I find this access points to be so great, so good looking, so freaking sexy. I had to keys one of those APs but it's not just the APs that allow us to make all of that magic happen I had to treat my sidekick equally so I had to kiss it as well right I'm in love with these devices so as always guys like after this event just about now I started to have a good night's sleep because I was overexcited from the trip to Vegas and this particular event was very close to my heart because all the nerds all the beers and everything else was so spot on thank you everyone for coming over to the event. If you were there, I probably had a chat with you. If you haven't been there, come over next year. It's worth it. It's amazing. And most importantly, thank you very much, HPE team, for putting it together. Thanks for sharing the stats. Thanks for being an open book. It's tremendously valuable for the community to see this, 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 the stats and then to maybe copy our style a little bit. So don't over-engineer these things. It was very simple, very practical, but it was working perfectly. And even after people, they were leaving their uh, their training sessions and they were coming over to our booth and we had like 100, 150 or 200 people in a very small space. We were still able to tap into six gigahertz and use Wi-Fi comfortably for all the demos. It never stopped. It never had any connectivity issues. So well done, team. Thank you very much for putting it together. Uh, before we wrap up, wrap up, there is a couple of things we wanted to um, to mention. The next webinar, if you want to get signed up early, is going to be a bit of a step back and covering some wireless fundamentals and how you can get going with Echo House and some best practices for uh, doing site surveys and different types of survey modes and just covering, again, all of those, uh, really enforcing that fundamental knowledge to get you going to be able to have a great Wi-Fi network. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Uh, Dale, do we have yeah. any questions? Yeah, so Josh, this question is for you. And I think you did a cover it and address it, but I think you said that the 730 series access points do require AOS 10. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So uh, they're going to be supported in AOS 10. And so that's managed by Central, right? There, There's no AOS 8 support for the Wi-Fi 7 uh, access points. Um, we're going to start supporting those starting in 10.7 which we're in an active beta right now. Um, and 10.7 will, will be what the seven, the AP 735 ship with. Okay, perfect. So, so the follow up to that, that question was, is that permanent or will there be future support for AOS 10? I mean, eight rather for those. Uh, not at this time. No, they're, they're, they're from a product perspective. We're not considering it currently. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I think someone asked something, Josh, around the um, USB port of your access points. It, what um, what typically would that you be used for? That USB port. Yeah. So the access point itself has some IoT radios in it. So there's actually two IoT radios in it. But if you want to extend it even further, or use say a frequency for an IoT protocol that's not Bluetooth or Zigbee, say you want to use some 900 megahertz. Um, IOT technology that that's what the USB port is for. Um, and so it's just a platform 
to help transport um, whatever IoT connector you need uh, to the to device plugged into the access point. So we're would, like the data transport in a sense. Would one case. of those would one of those IoT devices or sensors be kind of your UXI sensor that you can attach to the AP? It it could be, uh, but we have our own hardware uh, for the UXI sensors. Um, and we even are looking, we, we even started, uh, uh, we have a, a agents that we can install on um, different devices as well, whether they're like Zebra devices or Windows devices or Mac OS. Um, we have software agents for UXI sensors as well. Um, we don't have any that plug into the access point at this point. It's a good idea okay. though. I just uh, I just thought I'd mention the UX license because when we was at Vienna and uh, Dobius showed in one of his presentations that you can actually design uh, for how many UX licenses you'd need in your environment, actually in Eckhart AI Pro. So you can actually go and find the Aruba UX sensor and then design to see how many you would need for your environment to cater for the uh, different amount of devices you want to connect to it. So um, a lot of people were very excited about that. We After um, Dobia showed it, Josh, I think you saw how many people come over to the booth and was like, oh, wow, I want to be able oh, to yeah. see the uh, UX sensor in, in Eckhart. We managed to get that in there. I think... We managed to get it into the software on Friday. Dobi has updated his slides on Sunday whilst he was flying to Vienna, and then the keynote was on Monday. Yeah, it's a very neat feature. Uh, and it, in order to plan how many UXI sensors you would need in order to uh, have some sort of client testing planned throughout your entire deployment that you need. Mm, perfect. Very cool. Oh, so uh, we have another couple of questions. We'll just, uh, why don't you be able to demonstrate the cable note tool in AI Pro? There seems to be a lot of interest around that. Yes, of course. I think um, there was someone in the team called Jacob. who He actually marked it that he was going to answer live. So I wonder if he wants to come on camera and answer how yeah, you yeah, can just, get... Just before, before that, guys, uh, <laughs> uh, Master is asking, hello, is that possible to get the Ekaho file? And of course, I'm putting in an email address in the <laughs> chat right now. So <laughs> uh, I, hit that email address to get the file. And I, can, I will be happy to share it with you. If you have an Echo license, I can share that file to, to if you. If you want to discuss any other things outside of Echo, you know, you can, you can send Matt an email as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, Mac. Um, regarding the uh, Mac, maybe you can show the cable note tool um, quickly. Well, that's being shown. The easy way to take this off, if you do want to change your faceplate cover, is actually you go down on the bottom of the um, of the sidekick here, right on here where the faceplate is, and then gently pry it off on the back like that carefully. But make sure to kiss your sidekick first. Right, yes. And then it will easily come off. This is also a great way to, to reveal your serial number, um, of course, uh, all the applicable, um, you know, FCC and um, in European and Australian kind of uh, uh, and and Canada type uh, uh, regulations as well. So that's always important when you're looking at your sidekick. Make sure that you're uh, you know you're using a device that's uh, that's regulated in those domains. So there you go. That's your sidekick cover, and then let's easily uh, put that on. Okay. And now uh, what we've seen on the screen, guys, I, I've done like a cheeky thing. I just used the uh, the Vegas HP event map i removed all our surveys uh, from the inspect survey tab I removed all the access points that we surveyed i just put like the inclusion area and then i asked eka how ai pro to do an automatic planning of the ux i sensors to cater for this space i disabled planning for capacity you just planning for coverage from the sensor it's like a think of it in a reverse so that's what sensor could hear so to cover this particular space we would need to have six uxi sensors how amazing is that so now let's take a look at the cable node. Guys, we have a cable node under the, under the uh, letter C, keyboard shortcut, but it's super, super extremely simple. So self-explanatory, you pick up your color and then you start drawing the node and you can get the distance, you can get some nodes, you can attach a picture to it if you want to. Uh, I can view the nodes, I can add a peak, upload the peak, take a peak. You can do that from uh, from uh, from any device of choice. It's sleek, it's simple, and probably quite helpful. Perfect. 
Well, uh, we have gone over by a few minutes time. So thank you very much for all the amazing questions and uh, for Josh today for your time. Uh, such great information. And it's so cool to see the uh, that really large Wi-Fi 7 deployment. I know that I picked up a lot of great tips and things to think about for when I finally start deploying some Wi-Fi 7 access points. Josh, I don't actually have any Wi-Fi 7 here. <clears throat> hint, hint, maybe. Uh, uh, no, I'm only kidding. But um, thank you so much, we'll everybody. See. But uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us, Josh, for a fantastic presentation and the Ekahal team for putting all this on together for us. So I know uh, so much hard work goes into this and we can't wait to see you on the next webinar. So, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your day.